So hello everyone. Um, I went to Rome recently. Where does the, how does it work? Down? Oh, the down button. Okay. I went to Rome recently and I passed by an exchange office, a currency exchange office at the airport. And when I saw it, I was shocked. So I looked at these prices and what you see is that the spread is really massive. So for example, let's look at the Japanese yen. Unfortunately, it's a little bit blurry, but I hope you can see it. Let's look at Japanese yen. And if you want to provide Japanese yen for one euro, you need to give 167 yen to the office. But if you want to exchange a, a euro back to yen, you only get 128 yen. And if you look at the other currencies, you see similar uh, relationships, really massive spread, and almost feels like a ripoff, in my opinion. I think all of you guys already were in a similar situa uh, situation, so you really can relate to this. And I really wonder when I saw this, why in traditional finance, um, the forex market, the foreign exchange market is still so, has still these ridiculous fees, is still so uh, in, um, intransparent because you don't know who's actually in the background, who takes your fees, um, and so on. And I thought the answer, and I think you also agree, the answer is blockchain. The answer is stable coins, and the answer is forex markets on blockchain. And that's precisely what our project Pendulum is going to address. Hello everyone, I'm the CTO of Pendulum, I'm Thorsten, and let me first give you some background about our project. So Pendulum itself is a parachain project on Polkadot. Um, we are not live yet, but uh, we, our goal is to be live at the beginning of next year. However, we are already live on Kusama with our parachain called Amplitude. So Amplitude is basically the same, but on Kusama. Our mission is to connect DeFi networks to the DeFi, uh, to uh, connect fiat networks to the DeFi ecosystem. And what that means is that our goal is to become the central hub for fiat coins and stable tokens. To be more sp uh, specific, we also tailor our blockchain for Forex. That means that if you intend to build an application for Forex, we provide the ideal ecosystem for you. Um, in addition to this, something that's also special for us and important is that we're going to integrate or build integration for local banks. And what that means is what I want to show you on this next slide. This is an example of a currency transfer or cross-border transfer from uh, Europe to Tanzania. So I want to pay someone in Tanzania. I start with Europe, with euros, and want that uh, my recipient in Tanzania receives Tanzanian shilling, which is the local currency in Tanzania. And now if you want to do this with Pendulum, then Pendulum uses local banking and fintech integrations in both Europe and Tanzania to tokenize euros and to detokenize a Tanzanian shilling in the target region. So the only missing component is then happening in Pendulum where you need to exchange those tokens. You need to exchange a euro token to a Tanzanian shilling token before you can detokenize the Tanzanian shilling token in Tanzania. And in order to do this, we use the power of a Forex automated market maker. And a Forex automated market maker is an automated market maker that's optimized for Forex. That means that you have single-sided liquidity pools, which is optimized for this, or um, price curves that are optimized for Forex, or also a backstop pool based, for example, on USDC. Now, it becomes apparent that local banking integrations are very important for us, but I also said that Pendulum is all about stable coins, the central hub for stable coins. In order to get there, we also want to bring in all kinds of stable coins from other blockchain ecosystems. So we look at many different blockchain ecosystems that have a great support for stable coins and build bridges to them. And we have been looking at a lot of these ecosystems in the last couple of months and years actually. And when we studied those blockchains and how to build bridges to them, it became apparent that all these different blockchains use very different technologies. And with different technologies, you also need to build many different bridges. And just building one bridge is already complicated enough. So for that reason, we came up with the concept of Spacewalk. That's our abstract concept for building bridges in a unified manner that are optimized for stable coins and that are bridges for particular for Polkadot parachains. And uh, with building this bridge, with this building the Spacewalk bridge, we make it possible to not just bring in stable coins to Pendulum, 
but also make them available to the whole parachain ecosystem on Polkadot and of course also Kusama because you have built-in bridges on, on, on Polkadot anyway. So once the, par the, the tokens are there, everyone can use them on Polkadot. Now I think it became apparent what's important for us. First we have local banking integrations, then we have the, the Spacewalk Bridge as a really fundamental concept for bringing in stable coins, and we have different kinds of Forex AMMs. And this is just something I want to focus on, but there are of course also other aspects that are really important for Pendulum. Basically every stablecoin DeFi application you can think of is a valid use case for Pendulum. But here in this presentation I want to particularly focus on the Spacewalk Bridge and on Forex AMMs. So let me start with the, with the Spacewalk Bridge. I already said that Spacewalk is a unified bridge concept for Dotsama. But to be more technical, it's actually a bridge concept for substrate-based chains. So for all kind of parachains, for example. I want to point out that Spacewalk itself is not just a concept, but it's also a concrete implementation. It is an implementation that's rewarded with a Web3 grant. And of course, we are going to use this implementation on Pendulum, but it's actually totally independent of Pendulum. It resides in its own repository. Every parachain can actually use it for their own purposes not just Pendulum, and if you want to use it on your parachain, you basically just pl plug in a pallet. As you're familiar with substrate chains, they have these components called pallets. You can just plug in the Spacewalk pallet on your parachain. In addition to this, you also need to run a couple of services, for example, uh, price, uh, some kind of oracles, or some, price, some kind of custodian services. Really depends on what kind of concrete bridge you're actually going to use to what blockchain. Now, let me talk about the main features for Spacewalk. When we developed Spacewalk, we had three criteria in mind that are really important for us. The first one is it's that, it's, that it truly has to be decentralized. We studied a lot of different bridge concepts, and of course, the older bridge concepts are very decentralized, but also some other bridge, bridges claim to be decentralized, although they don't really meet our standard of decentralization. And uh, unfortunately, this year, there were like so many really high-value attacks on bridges it started with a big attack in March where someone stole, I forgot the name of the bridge, but someone stole $600 million from a single bridge. And this just happened because the bridge wasn't really decentralized. So decentralization really matters if you want to have a secure bridge. In addition to this, Spacewalk is trust minimized. That means that if you have to interact with a human actor, then that human actor will be economically incentivized not to misbehave. Or if they misbehave, then at least you're guaranteed to get your money back as a user. Thirdly, st a Spacewalk is censorship resistant. That means, again, if you have to interact with a human actor, that human actor could deny service to you, but you can always go to another, uh, to another provider in that decentralized network, or you can provide your own service in that network, and at the end, Spacewalk always guarantees service to you. Now, after this very, well, let, let me point out again that uh, Spacewalk is a decentralized concept that's unified and if you want to spa use Spacewalk in your bridge then you have different components to these different blockchains that you want to bridge to but the API layer to your own network is really unified with the unified API. Now after this very theoretical presentation of Spacewalk I want to look at one particular instance which is a bridge to Stella, another blockchain. And that particular instance is very interesting for us as P at Pendulum because Stella has a really great supply of stablecoins. I'm talking about fiat-backed stablecoins that are 100% collateralized with fiat and that are compliant and that are not something like algorithmic stablecoins that made really bad, new bad news this year. So this is something we can rely on. And what's also really interesting for Stella is that they have local banking integrations to get those coins on their chain and they have stable coins from many, many different countries, for example, Brazilian reais, Nigerian Naira, Mexican pesos, and so on. So this is a very interesting use case for Pendulum, as I said, for uh, uh, the, the central app for stable coins. Of course, we want to have them on our network. Now, this network, uh, this bridge to Stella is very interesting. First, Stella doesn't support smart contracts. And this is actually very similar to Bitcoin, which doesn't have smart contracts. And for that one reason, Spacewalk for Stellar is actually built on that really great concept of the InterBTC bridge. We already heard about this morning. Um, InterBTC is really a great concept. 
uh, peer-reviewed research, really decentralized. I don't need to repeat this again. You already learned about this today. But it's really something that we want to build on. But there are, of course, some very crucial differences because we don't bridge to Bitcoin, but we bridge to Stellar. And one main concept, one main difference is the Stellar Oracle that you see here in the middle. But before I go to talk about the Stellar Oracle, let me first talk about this general diagram. Bear with me. There are different components here. I will go through them one by one. First, we have two, uh, we have two blo uh, blockchains. And these are uh, the orange boxes that you see here. So on the one hand, you have the Stellar blockchain. And on the other side, you have a substrate chain, for example, Pendulum. Now, if you want to bridge a token from Stellar to the substrate chain, then you cannot actually move that over. What you do instead is that you simulate that move. That's what a bridge does. The bridge simulates that the token goes from one chain to another chain. And this simulation basically always works in similar ways. So what you do is that if you want to send a token from this account on the Stellar chain to an account on the Substrate chain, then you lock that token in special accounts on the Stellar side. And those accounts are called vaults, like on InterVTC. And as long as the coins are locked in those vaults, they are rendered unusable on Stellar. And as long as this is the case, you can then mint a copy of that coin on the substrate side. And this copy is called a wrap token, as you know. Now, because Stellar doesn't allow for smart contracts, those vaults are operated by human actors and not by smart contracts. Smart contracts would be reliable because you can study that they behave the way you intend. Human actors can run away with the money. And for that reason, the human actors are incentivized not to misbehave through collaterals. Similar like, it's very similar like, to, uh, like an InterBTC, again. A great concept and that really works to, incentivize mis uh, to disincentivize misbehavior. In addition to this, you also have a price oracle on the substrate side. This price oracle is required in order to value the, the value of the lock tokens inside the vault against the value that's inside the collateral, that's, that's locked in the collateral. And you need this price feed oracle because the tokens that are locked on the Stellar side and the tokens that you use in the collateral are usually different. Let's say you have a USDC coin that you want to bridge, then the USDC coin is, is locked in the vault. But as a collateral, would probably use uh, the dot, polka dot native, to uh, native coin. And now, if, if you see that the collateral is not enough anymore to cover the cost of the vaults or to cover that value, then you need to liquidate the vault, and the user will get their money back. So far, it's very similar to InterBTC. Now, the main component that's different is the Stellar Oracle. That's a very crucial component, because it's a component that tells the substrate side, the pallet on the substrate side, what actually happens on Stellar side. And this is, of course, something that you need in a bridge. It's, for example, important if someone wants to send tokens from Stellar to Substrate and, and locks those tokens in the vault, then the Substrate chain needs to know about this in order to mint a wrapped token. And this needs to be reliable. This is the weakest link in the whole bridge, because if, if someone finds a way to hack that system and to, to represent wrong information to the Substrate chain, then tokens can just be minted out of thin air and you can steal money. And this is basically how a lot of the hacks work. For that reason, it's very crucial to us that the Stellar Oracle works 100% reliable. And this is actually the case. So an Oracle quite often sounds like it requires trust and is centralized, but the Stellar Oracle, that's not the case. It's truly trustless, it's truly decentralized, and it's provably secure and provably as secure as um, the Stellar Consensus Protocol itself. That's a protocol for Stellar how Stellar finds consensus, it's very special. And also, our Stellar Oracle is tailor-made for this protocol. It really goes into the details of how this protocol works. And for that reason, it can be proven to be secure. Now, finally, I want to show a roadmap of, uh, of Spacewalk for Stellar. Um, I already said that this is a Web3 grant project. And two of the milestones are completed, which is the Stellar Oracle and the basic structure. And we're currently working on the third milestone, which is supposed to, uh, to be finished by the end of the year, and this is to implement the collateralization technology. Now, I want to go to talk about Forex AMMs, the other important aspect for Pendulum. Let me first talk about the philosophy about how you build a blockchain and how you distinguish between the runtime and the application side. Let's first look at a general purpose blockchain like Ethereum. On a general purpose blockchain, you basically have two different layers. 
One is the runtime layer, which is the blockchain itself. This is usually hard-coded logic that rarely ever changes. And then you have the application layer. These are smart contract developers that build smart contracts on top of the blockchain. And of course, there's a lot of flexibility. You can constantly develop, develop uh, or deploy a new smart contract. And uh, if you develop an AMM, then you usually do it as a smart contract. Now, on substrate chains, base chains or on parachains, you use a different philosophy because they are not special, uh, they are not general purpose anymore, but they are special purpose chains. And what that means is that this application layer is moved down a little. So the application layer now resides halfway in the runtime level and on the original smart contract level. So what that means is that out of the smart contracts that are important for your own use case, you try to abstract and find common components that all those smart contracts have in common. And you put them into a component you call a palette on substrate. And this palette is now part of the runtime. But something that's better than Ethereum is that on substrate and on, on Polkadot, it's very easy to change that. It's easy to integrate new runtime upgrades. So it's much more flexible than Ethereum. Then in addition to this, you still have your smart contract layers where implementers can build different technologies. So if you have different AMMs on our blockchain and they, they, have, they have common components, but they also have differences, and the differences will then be implemented as a smart contract. In order, well, maybe I can show it here again. So you have, you have special palettes that abstract from common logic for those Forex AMMs, and you have for different Forex AMMs as smart contracts built on top of this. Now, in order to understand why you need different, uh, what, what those pendulum-specific palettes actually do, let's have a quick look at how automatic markers, ma market makers actually work, in case you're not familiar with this. Uh, I show a very simple example here of a so-called fo uh, constant function market maker. A constant function market maker, you can imagine, has two liquidity pools in the simplest case. In this case, let's look at a market maker between US dollars and euros. And I represent those liquidity pools as jars. And what I also do is that I represent the amount of US dollars and euros in those liquidity pools by this diagram. On the x-axis, you have the amount of euros. On the y-axis, you have the amount of US dollars. And every single state of that automatic market maker is always represented by the amount of US dollars and euros in those liquidity pools. So you can always represent every state as a, as a point in this diagram. In this case, I have three US dollars, three euros, and it would be represented by this red dot. Now, what a constant function market maker does in addition to this is that it introduces a price curve. This is the blue curve you see there. And a constant function market maker has the contract to ensure that the state or this red dot of the market maker always stays on this curve, whatever happens. Let's look at an example and say I want to I have some US dollars and I want to exchange them to euros using the market maker. What that actually means is I give some US dollars to the market maker and I take out some euros from that liquidity pool. And uh, let's say I want to have two euros. That means that the market maker now moves, uh, looks where the dot ends. If you move it two euros to the left, just goes up so that it lands on that curve again and can then see that in this example, it, needs to, it, it requires three US dollars from me for this exchange. So I need to give a few more US dollars than euros. It's not one to one in this example. You can also see that the, the price curve there is a little bit steeper. That actually rep represents that I need to give more US dollars. Now, of course, I can also go in the other direction. So if I start at the original point again, and I want to actually make an exchange in the other way, then giving euros for US dollars then actually just means that the point moves in that direction. Let's just assume there is another person coming in who wants to make another transfer now, now that the state is at that, at that point and wants to get even more US dollars out of this, then that person would, for example, in this case, only get half US dollar for another three Euro coins. You see that the curve gets flatter and flatter. And actually, that slope of the curve really represents the current exchange rate. Now, what's really nice about constant function market makers is that arbitrageurs will always come in to push that point around so that the point always lands at the point at, or at the position where the current slope or the current exchange rate really represents the external actual exchange rate of this currency pair. And it's really great for a user who wants to make an exchange with this market maker because the market maker will always provide the current actual exchange rate. That's great for the user, but it's actually not great for the liquidity provider. 
because the liquidity provider carries a high risk due to these arbitrageurs. And, and you probably heard about impermanent loss. This is, pro for example, one of these risks that the, that the liquidity providers have to carry. And for that reason, there are other concepts of market makers where the risk for the liquidity provider is lowered. One example would be a proactive market maker. This is a market maker that does not rely on arbitrageurs to represent the current exchange rate, but who actually uses a price feed oracle to use the current price of these asset pairs to, this, to determine what the actual uh, exchange rate should be, and then constantly adapts that price curve. For example, it rotates the price curve around, around the current position so that the actual exchange rate is achieved. And that's a very great concept, definitely, for the liquidity providers. Now, with all that knowledge, let's go back to the original diagram, and now we can understand what the typical components are that Pendulum will provide. For example, there's, there, there would be a palette for constant function market makers, or of course an Oracle palette, which is really important for many applications, particularly if you want to make DeFi on stable coins. Then a token quality palette is also something that's important. And for example, there would be a proactive market maker palette for proactive market makers, and so on. And now you might wonder what those smart contracts still have to implement now that we have all these nice palettes. Now, um, I think it becomes clear after I showed that there are different uh, kind of um, market makers that you can have, that there's of course still a lot of logic that needs to reside in those smart contracts. Uh, for example, you might implement different price curves or you want to improvise, uh, implement different structures of liquidity pools. The simple example that we saw was with only two liquidity pools, but you might have a market maker where you have liquidity pools for all kinds of stable coins, let's say 50 different stable coins, and now you want to manage that with, with a simple market maker, with a single market maker. Um, you also need to handle price feeds if you use an external oracle. Um, there are also different risk models to averse risks to avert risks for liquidity providers, um, and you also need to provide incentives for liquidity providers. Otherwise, they would of course not provide the liquidity. So let me finish with this final slide where I talk about the current status of market makers on Pendulum. There are two initial projects. One is an experimental project that we developed ourselves, and it's based on Uniswap V2, which is a very established market maker. Uh, we have two different implementations, one in Inc, the smart contract language for Polkadot, and the other one is a direct palette integration, and this allows us actually to balance the right feature set between the smart contract layer and the palette layer so that we can determine what the, the ideal API for our Forex ecosystem would be. On the other side, we have a next generation market maker, which is a community project on Pendulum, and this is called Project Amber. This is very advanced. It uses latest research. They published a white paper recently and described some very interesting concepts in there that provides um, a market maker that has really low risk for liquidity providers and still gives a really high value for users who want to actually do an exchange with that. With that, I will close my talk. I thank, thank you a lot. I want to invite you to get involved in our project or at least to go to our link tree to check out what we have in there for you or to follow us on Twitter or to get involved directly in our open source project, of course, on Pendulum, on Spacewalk or Market Makers or to actually uh, consider to build a community project on top of Pendulum. Thanks a lot, and if you want to connect with me, you have some links here. Okay, thank you, Thorsten. Can you just take a mic for, mic for a second? Yes. Uh, so, Thorsten actually attend to the, one of the side events yesterday to tour the beer, and I wanted to ask him if he tried some beer, if it was nice, and if you try maybe some uh, Czech traditional food, and what do you say? The food is amazing here. I, I checked something, checked some Czech food yesterday. Um, I forgot the name of this though. Some yeah. cheese, some pickled cheese, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was very nice. Nakladaný <laughs> sír. Yes, he loved it. it. Oh my God. <laughs> if, you, if you saw the face, he was like a baby. He just yeah, got what absolutely. he wanted. Okay. Thank you, Thurston, one more time. Thank you for your talk.